Ah, we have somebody. We have one viewer. I can stop humming to myself now. Good evening. Reveal yourself, single viewer. Do not be shy. Say hi. Don't say bye. I guess it's a bit early for the American crowd and just getting on being a bit late for the UK crowd. Ah, we have number two watching. Perhaps number two will say hi and not say bye. Really wanted to just have a a debrief, if you like, after the uh, Blake Mar Briars visit this afternoon, which was really, really interesting. Um, is the audio okay? Can you hear? Well, I guess that's... Uh, we have a couple of viewers. So I really do want to talk about um, this afternoon's visit to Blake Mar Brise, but I'd like to wait for a few more people, which makes this bit a bit boring. And in the meantime, I can show you the pipe that uh, I got back from Mike. So. I went to Blake Mar Briars this afternoon, as I've said, had a great time. I'd pre-arranged it with Mike to come and visit him. I sent him uh, a couple of pipes in advance, um, pipes that I'd made, but asked him to make some uh, stems for me. So this is the first one. This is the panelled pipe that I made uh, in December. And it's it's gone a little bit off there you can see once you get the stem on you can see that sort of bit there is a little bit it could do with being a little bit straighter but um overall it's pretty good the uh still is a little bit going off to the side but that's not the end of the world this pipe is really just a um it's it's my learning phase really, it's my learning curve. And this pipe is a I think it was excuse me, uh, number what is it? I didn't write it down on this one. I did stamp on some of them which number pipe it was that I'd done, that I'd made. Um and all over from here is L C eighteen, which is London calling for twenty eighteen. And I was considering giving it the honey treatment tonight getting some honey on it and smoking it. I've uh, cleaned it out with alcohol. Uh, it does still have a bit of a funky smell. You get when you cut the stems, the ebonite stems, they don't have a particularly attractive smell when you cut the, and the dust goes flying around. Um, and I can just get that through the bowl as well. So I've, I've put uh, alcohol through it but uh, I think it might want another clean. It's 9 mil.
All right, well, I think I'm going to leave it for now. Perhaps wait till there's more of an audience. Um, I haven't scheduled this uh, video. Oh, somebody else has just popped in. Um, oh, four people now. Okay, so we, we are getting a little bit of an audience. We're at five. Okay, so we're picking up. Anybody care to say hello? Four people back. Cherry on top. How are you doing? Well, if a few more people come on, then I'll, I'll not go. Uh, for the last five minutes, there was two people on, but they weren't willing to speak, which is fair enough. You can't force people. Um, but um, I just really wanted to do a little bit of a de debrief of my visit to Blake Mars today. Um, but I think I'm a little bit early for the US viewers. I'm in the middle of um, editing a 55 minute video of my visit. It's edited rather, and now it's just uh, rendering. That's going to take a fair old amount of time to render. My computer is not the most modern of all. The afternoon discussion drive was very on the bottom of my recent thoughts, by the way. Oh, right, yeah, that's fair enough. I guess not. It's a bit early. Um, the thing is that it's the middle of the week, so I can't really do a really late one. Um, I'm going to be up early in the morning. I'm going to be getting up around quarter past six in the morning, so I can't do too late. Um, Eric. So you didn't get fired, Eric, I see. It went very, very well. I had a great time. I'm just uh, in the middle of rendering a video, so you'll be able to get it in all its glory. It's almost an hour's worth of footage, which is really cool. Um, this was one which he did whilst I was there, and the other one, the Eskimo shape pipe, he's still working on, which is um, pretty good for on the fly. I mean, he had, he had a... It was kind of uh, handicapped because obviously the, the quality of the finish in terms of shaping was not spot on. So you can see there, that uh, bit there is not quite right. And that's my fault, not his fault. He's met the end of my shank there as best he can. But uh, the finished product is nice. I wanted a sort of a square shanked and stemmed levat. And that's essentially what we've got here. So were you actually in the middle of a lesson, uh, Eric? Surely not. Hi, Boris. Yeah, it was really cool. It's uh, the second time I visited. Um, they were working quietly. <laughs> I don't know how you get away with that. You could have got fired, so you know that. If you'd have got caught, you could have got fired. Big risk. Um, I was, he's got a signing in book. He's got a, a visitor's book inside his showroom. And I don't know why, but I was looking through the names to see your name. And it just, I don't know why I thought for a second that you'd be in there. I think it's because you've spoken about him so much that I just, I think I must have just assumed that you've been there. And then I thought, what on earth am I doing? He lives in the US. Why would he be in this book? So then I sort of cottoned on and just caught myself. Um, I tell you what, uh, Cherry, in terms of the lathe, I, I, I keep jumping backwards and forwards on whether I should and shouldn't. But if you watch, when you watch the video, you'll see that there is really only one conclusion, and that is to get a lathe, because there's so much that I can't do w without it. So, for instance, when you're cutting a stem, when you're sizing up a stem essentially when you're what I was planning on doing is I've got a a whole bunch of stems here a lot of which I got from Danny so for instance what I was planning on doing but because I 
am short on knowledge in respect to pipe smoking, I didn't realize that it's not really very practical. So what I intended on doing was measuring up the diameter of a stem, 9.1, and then drilling the end of the shank to match. But all these rough stems are rough. They need to be sanded. They're, they're pressed, they're pre-pressed, but they have to be prepared and they have to be finished. They have to be sanded. All these sort of uh, seams have to be gotten rid of and you've got to shape it a little bit, you've got to clean up and round off the, the button, you've got to bend it a bit if you want to, and there's numbers here which are stamped on which have to be rubbed down, sanded down. Um, the whole thing has to be prepared, and so the diameter will change. Um, and without some method of turning it, there's no way of keeping it completely circle. Um, if I was to use it on my sanding disc, I would just be taking chunks out of it and going round, but it wouldn't be a, a round circle anymore. So. Um, so I really have come to the conclusion that using existing stems I can only do with a lathe or with some kind of uh, tenon cutter. Um, there is another method um, which is essentially to, which is what I was planning on doing, which is you, you get your blank without the peg on it, without the tenon on it, and you insert the, uh, whether it's a 9mm or not a 9mm, it doesn't really make a difference if it's 9mm or not, but you have, this is the 9mm peg, uh, tenon if you want to call it, and so essentially you would drill a hole in the mid centre of that, glue this in, and then these are consistent diameters, and then I can get a drill bit to match and then drill the end of the shank, and you're done. Um, that was the idea, and I can still do that. But it still does... Yeah, a military mount would work as well, that's true. Um, but again, even with a military mount, uh, it depends to what extent they are prepared and finished. Because if they're not done well and, I, and they need to be finished again, it would need to be in some form of turning. Um, here you go. This is a, a military mount or army mount, whatever you want to call it. But again, you see, you've got these numbers on it. You've got these seams which need to come off. So that I could get off um, with sandpaper or whatever. Um, mm, perhaps it's doable, but as you say, it's limiting. And also, that's a really hefty diameter on the end of that stem. Um, most of them are much narrower by the time you're finished. And that's a 9mm, so that's no good. Um, this is a Paul's pipe, Paul Nard, and he uses nylon or Teflon. Um, tenons, and it's the same principle, that's drilled and glued. That is actually the same principle. That's 8mm, well, 7.9 it's saying there. Um, so there you go, you'd get an 8mm drill bit and drill the other side, and that's it. Let's have a look. Let's see if I can get it small enough. Eight mil. That's eight mil on the dot. So that's officially seven point nine, but it must be a little bit, it obviously it can't measure to such precise um, details to, to sort of almost uh, nano uh, measurements. Yeah, Cherry, so it would seem. Um, I'll tell you the honest truth, what I might be doing is when I get off tonight, is I might go uh, back onto the Axminster website and have a look. I had ordered um, a workbench from Axminster and um, I changed my mind on it because I, I, I mentioned it in one of my previous videos. It, it was just a luxury which was unnecessary. 
Um, what I need is just a plain old surface, a rock solid surface, rather than anything technical, because I'm not doing woodworking, traditional woodworking, I'm just doing pipe cutting. So I've sent that back. So I'm thinking that with that money, which I'd anyway allocated to the table, it would be much better spent on a lathe. So I might just tell them not to refund it, and I might just put it towards a lathe and, and just go and just take the plunge. Whoever I've spoken to has told me that's the only way to go, really. Um, there's a guy on YouTube. I'm just trying to... Excuse me, sorry. There's a guy on uh, on YouTube who makes pipes, and I did. He shows you a video of the whole process. Excuse me, sorry. I've just been drinking Diet Coke, so a bit repetitive. Um, there you go. Um, I actually encourage you to watch this if you're into this kind of thing and you enjoy watching pipes being made. This is um, Derek Tonti, uh, an Italian guy, I think, or Dennis, Dennis Tonti. And here he shows how he makes a pipe from beginning to end. Obviously, not every second of it, but it's, um, it's a 20 minute video. And he shows um, how he does it, and he doesn't use a lathe. So. Um, that's kind of where I was, the, the direction I was trying to go. But I, I don't think I can get away with it, to be honest, without a lathe. There's just too many things which, which can be done on the lathe. Um, without it, I'd be restricted to free hands, pretty much. Um, and really and truly, the way to start is on traditional shapes, I would have thought. So, um, Yeah, Cherry on top. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, Cherry. Um, when you've watched this channel long enough, you'll know that I'm very bad with remembering names. Um, Eric, by the way, he did remember you when I gave him your regards. I showed him your message on on uh, on Messenger, and he um, I, he he asked me. He said your surname, um, but I took it off. I edited it out of the video. I wasn't sure if you'd want it on there. You only go by Cherry. Fair enough. No problem at all. I understand that fully. Um, Yeah, so I'm I'm I am excited. I appreciate your nice comment, but I'm excited, really excited myself to to see it. But I must tell you, in terms of uh, actually getting my hands on a lathe for the very first time, it was very exciting. Um, it was I was a little bit daunted by it, and for good reason because when I um, he's he the chisels he was using were actually really small, and I think the feedback that you get through the chisel is multiplied and magnified as a result. Um, and I think those chisels have probably been used for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and I think that it'll be easier with the, the bigger chisels. I, th I think, I hope. Um, I'd really love to have more time on, on, a, on a lathe, to be honest. Um, but um, the way his lathe was set up, he was using, um, you'll see it in the video, he's, he, he kind of puts the, ch the rest at an unusual angle the tool rest, and then he puts another tool on top of it, and then you rest the chisel on, on that tool. And I found all of that very awkward. And he's been doing it for 30, 40 years, and I've been doing it for like 10 seconds. Um, so it was, I just really wanted to have a go. And I managed to turn um, the top of a bowl, and uh, you'll see that in the video, and it was really cool. And uh, no, this is a guy who's in Lichborough. Um, he's, he's got a workshop. And um, the guy you're thinking of is Ian Walker of uh, Northern Briars. And um, I think he's going to be my next venue for a visit. He's much further up north. Um, it took me about an hour and 20 minutes to drive up, which wasn't too bad. Driving down was worse. The weather was terrible. Uh, it was snowing, heavily snowing. Thankfully not settling um, because it had rained beforehand. But uh, the weather, the drive back was... Um, I was going to talk and record on the way, but I, I just decided it was too risky. Um, hi, Meeks. Um, and I had to really focus on the driving. 
it was pretty treacherous uh, driving conditions. Um, but uh, I really, really would like to get up to Ian Walker as well and just to see how another guy does it. Um, he, he did mention a, a, a carver who I'd never heard of who's based in Cornwall in here in the UK. Um, and his name is um, Larry Sons um, Pipes. And he's an American guy or a Canadian guy married to a girl from Cornwall. He's got a stunning workshop and his output, the pipes that if you look at his gallery, his, his, the, the, it's so arty. The stuff that he does, is, they're really art. They're art forms, uh, sculptures. Um, and, uh, but it, nothing, he's got nothing out for sale. Everything that was on sale is, is, is gone. And on the more basic ones, his prices are very good. I mean, his basic ones are also works of art, but they're you know, less than 200 pounds for really nice looking pipes. Um, so I've sent him an email to ask him uh, how often he puts out pipes and just to talk about pipe making and so on. I'd like to get to know him. Um, in the video you'll see we were talking about uh, how few carvers are left here in the UK and uh, it's just Mike, Ian Walker, um, Eldritch Pipes and Chris Asquith and there's uh, Martin Drancefield, part-time, sort of, uh, he does it when he can or when he fancies. Um, he's helped me a lot actually, uh, giving me a lot of advice, which I really am grateful for. There's Tom Phillips, who I've got a few of his pipes, um, but he's not carving at all at the moment. Um, so th there's there's a few sort of jobbers um, who do it on the side. Um, probably what I will end up doing, if it works out, um, certainly in the, for the foreseeable future. Um, hi Sandro, how are you doing? Um, but there's really very few carvers are left here in the UK um, and you compare it to Italy, France, the US, Denmark, you know, it all, although people talk about it being born in uh, France, in uh, St. Claude, but uh, the English pipe, generally speaking, is the pipe when people remember or think about the pipe. It's either a classic Dunhill billiard or a or a Sherlock Holmes pipe, um, uh, Peterson, which I suppose is Irish, not English. Um, but um, it's it's. I asked him, and that's in the video as well. I asked him, you know, whether he felt that there was a resurgence um, to pipe smoking generally, um, and he said he's not noticed <laughs> because he's always been busy, you know, from day one. So for the last thirty, forty years, he's always had a constant stream of work. And I asked him, where's the majority of your business? Is it here? Is it the States? Is it in Europe? He said, no, the majority of his work is in the, in the UK, which was actually very, very pleasing to hear. Uh, either he's still got a very sort of solid um, customer base that still comes to him on a regular basis, you know, people who might have been smoking for 30, 40 years, whilst it was still de rigueur. Um, hi, Hector. Hi. Hi. Um, but um, I was really surprised to hear him say that. Really surprised. <laughs> yes, Cherry. Um, I'm a long way from jumping in as such. Um, I think I've got a long way to go. But um, I think if I can get the hang of a lathe, um, that will be a game changer. If I can get the hang of a lathe. But as I was saying, in terms of getting on the lathe, so I was really excited that he let me... I was going to ask him, it was on the tip of my tongue, but I just, I felt that I didn't want to ask. Um, it was kind of an imposition f to to ask to work on a mother, another man's tools. And uh, for some people, that's a very personal thing. You know, you don't want other people mucking around with your stuff, with your equipment. And, um, but he offered, which was amazing, you know. And it's really full credit to the pipe community, the pipe carving community, because... From what I've seen, certainly in the States as well, people who come into the piping trade, everything is learnt off other carvers, um, and they give of their time freely and willingly um, and warmly. You know, there's no sort of, um, I'm not going to share this trick because he might do my business in, you know, there's none of that. Um, and it's really, really encouraging to see. And Mike, you know, I was really, really delighted when he offered me to have a go on the lathe. Um, so I did. He, he put a block on the lathe, um, and uh, I mean that certainly is something which I still am worried about. Is the chuck? He, he had a, a custom-made chuck there, which has probably been in there for thirty or forty years, 
um, from when his uncle was uh, the main carver. High pipes, etc. Um, but he let me have a go. And uh, the first sort of, as I first started touching Yeah, that's true, Cherry. Um, I, I kind of touched on that with him when I was talking to him about, I asked him, um, you know, will you, uh, how long have you smoked a pipe for? Um, and kind of, I was trying to suss out exactly that point as to whether or not he started off as a jobber, just working as an apprentice um, and just was carving a pipe but didn't smoke a pipe or had he smoked a pipe. Um, and I was saying that I, I'm coming from the opposite angle of somebody who's been enjoying the hobby and then just slowly sort of through my passion um, with the hobby trying to get further into it by extending that sort of passion into making a pipe he said no he's been smoking since he was 17 years old and he grimaced as if to say yeah that's a long time i know and he's um i think he's well in his 70s he's past retirement age he told me Yeah, um, Eric, um, I kind of asked him those kind of questions about uh, succession planning, and you'll see that in the video. I won't spoil um, everything of the video. I don't want to tell you everything that's in there. I want you to enjoy it. Um, but it's it's quite a long video. I think it's 55 minutes, um, which is a good part of the time that I was there. I didn't want to do one of these videos where you kind of have a, a snapshot, and it's all d sort of summarized down to a 10 minute video i wanted you to actually experience it as if you were walking around and i tried to sort of ask him because he's a really humble person and um you have to kind of tease out the questions so i was trying to keep him talking as much as possible um and me being a, a bit of a mouthy person myself i was trying to control myself not to talk so much um so i was trying my best to let him to do the talking so that uh people can just, you know, listen to his wisdom and experience in respect of pipe carving. Um, but, um, yeah, he was, it was great. It was a great experience. And the highlight definitely um, was getting on that uh, lathe. But um, as I've been trying to say three times already, the first time I touched the wood with the, uh, with the uh, chisel, the kickback was actually quite uh, phenomenal. The feedback that comes through the chisel into your arm is actually pretty strenuous and I can feel it in my muscle now, in my, uh, um, what do you call that muscle on the inside of your wrist? That. Hi pirate, how you doing? So um, that um, sort of kickback that comes through um, is really quite strenuous. And obviously that muscle would build up over time, but you've really got to grip that chisel really, really hard, really tight. Um, and as I was saying earlier on, the setup of how he's got the, the tool rest was really quite alien for me. Compare, well, everything was all alien to me because I've never done it before, but just from watching so many people online, um, I'm one of those kind of people where I can watch things and learn from watching and then put it to practice when I, when I actually do it myself. Um, and obviously you hone that skill afterwards. Um, <laughs> hi Art. I, I'm a good mimicker, that's the bottom line. Is If I, I can watch somebody do something and a lot of the time I can just copy it without and, and copy it you know, reasonably well. Hi Tim, um, you'll be pleased to know Art that I spent very, very little money there. Um, I felt a bit guilty <laughs> because he'd given me so much of his time, but I paid him for the stem um, on, for this pipe, which is there. I was actually thinking of giving it the honey and maybe lighting it up tonight, but we'll see, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um,
so I paid him for that. I bought another tin of Zippo lighter fuel, lighter fuel because I'm well away through the current tin that I've got. I bought a pack of Zippo flints, genuine, mind you, genuine Zippo flints. And he also gave me some magazines, which I'm delighted with. Um, I've got one of these magazines, the Pipe Smokers Welcome Guide. This is back in the 90s, I think. What is this? 1996. So he's, he had three of them. He's got a pile of them there. He's got about half a dozen of each of these. Man, he just let me take one of each. Very nice of him. So I'm going to enjoy that when I go to meet the Queen. Certainly keep me occupied. Oh, nice. I'm glad to hear that, Sandro. I'll tell you something. When, hi, Ryan. Um, when you go through his showroom, and you'll see that in the video as well, and you can see on his website, the prices of his pipes are just, they actually beg a belief. Um, certainly, if I was to start selling my pipes at some point in the future, I wouldn't be selling them at his prices. And he's got 30 years experience behind him. If I was selling pipes for the prices that he sells them, I wouldn't bother. It just wouldn't be worth my while. Um, he's got, you know, the, the the bulldog that you looked at today, Eric. How much was it? Was it thirty-eight pounds, something like that, or forty-eight pounds? I don't remember. I wouldn't make a pipe for thirty-eight pounds. I just wouldn't do it. Um, the amount of time it takes. I mean, it could be that in twenty or thirty years' time, maybe I would if um, that was all I was doing. But at the moment, um, I wouldn't take time away from my pho photography work in order to make a pipe for 30 pounds, because to make a pipe for 30 or 40 pounds, which I would have to spend uh, at least four or five hours on, um, in combined time, it might be over a, a two or three day period, but uh, it just wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't be viable for me to work on that basis. Um, so we'll have to see. I don't know how that's going to work. That's, I'm probably going to have to put in a lot of time to get up to a certain standard whereby I could at least charge something more than that. Um, I, I, I wouldn't do it for 30 odd pounds. Just wouldn't. He had some really stunning pipes there. I mean, he does charge more for his for the really high-end pipes. The, there was a bent pipe there with great grain on it for £144. Um, but um, anything... Uh, up to, as you say, £70 pipes, etc. He's got a fantastic range of pipes. Um, I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to pipes, as you know. You can just look at my pipe range and you can see that. But uh, somebody who, who's um, looking for a good quality, robust smoking pipe, you could walk out of there. If you took £100 in, you could walk out of there with three or four pipes and have some change. And, and that's just phenomenal. And they'd be, and they'd last you a lifeline, a, li a lifetime. Those pipes. I honestly don't know how he does it. To be honest with you. Okay, it's it's kind of scales of economy because when he does a batch of pipes, he might do ten, fifteen, or twenty of the same pipes at the same time, and he'll do them in stages. And in a week, he might finish thirty or forty pipes. So if he's charging, say, fifty pounds in, uh, on a pipe, that's Fifteen hundred pounds for a week's work—that's good money. Um, I've got no idea what his output is, but uh, he, he's—he's certainly happy, and he's—he's he's going strong. When I asked him about his succession planning. That's a very good point, um, um, Hector. In, I, I, I talked about this in a video quite some time ago, maybe a year or so ago. Um, I noticed that, and I made the comparison between the English pipe carvers and the American pipe carvers. <coughs> Northern Briars is, is a good example. He's, I would say he's a, in terms of his pricing, he's a level above Blake Mar. Um, not completely, because they do share common ground on pricing. But um, I would say that uh, Ian's pipes start where um, Blake Mars 
start to move into the higher end. So for 70 or 80 pounds, you'll get a, a rocks cut uh, Northern Briars pipe. Um, and when you move up to the smooth pipes, you're looking at the 80, 90 pound mark. And then if you're getting a bit of silver work or a bit of Cumberland or something like that, or a decent grain, you're looking at 110, 120 pounds. Um, and if you go up to some of the more unusual ones like the uh, sea urchin and that kind of thing, you're going up to 150, 160 pounds. <coughs> But even that, the most expensive Northern Briars pipe, you're looking at that kind of money. Um, go to the American uh, carvers. There are some carvers who have been in the business for literally two or three years. And they're, I remember there's one, I can't remember the exact name, but there's one guy, actually not American. This guy comes from one of the ex-Eastern Bloc countries. I don't remember which. Excuse me. Um, I don't know if it was Romania or somewhere like that. Um, and I bought I bought a, a stunning horn pipe, which I, I regret selling now. Well, not regret, but it was a stunning pipe. But it was, certainly wasn't nine mil, so I wouldn't be smoking it anyway. Um, it is Northern Briars, the sea urchin. I mean, it's not really my taste, but it, I can acknowledge the skill that's gone into making that. Um, so I bought the pipe for about a hundred and twenty or a hundred and fifty dollars. A stunning pipe, a beautiful piece of briar, stained to perfection, straight grain on one side, bird's eye on the other side, Cumberland stem, a horn. Really beautiful pipe. Um, that was probably two, two and a half years ago. Now he's, I think he starts at around $300, something like that. And that's a very quick hike in price in, in, in the piping business. But in America, that's the way it goes. I mean, if you look at um, Jeff Grasick, he hasn't been, um, in the grand scheme of things, compared to some of the old masters, he hasn't been carving a pipe for that long, but he's already commanding a high price. Um, Abe Herbo, I, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but um, Herbo, 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 um, you know, his pipes are a little bit more realistic, but he's also starting at four or $500. Um, stunning work, you can't fault their work, but these are relatively young carvers. They're fantastic, they're skillful, and they're amazing. And I'm, I'm talking about already the higher end carvers, but there's lots of carvers at the lower end who, well, not lower end, but just the lower pricing end. Um, and they and their prices jump very quickly, very quickly. And and you're right, Hector, that you know if you if you go for a higher bracket, then you know you're looked upon as a higher bracket pipe carver. Um, I'll give you an example. When I first started doing photography, um, I used to pretty much take on any job because I wanted to work, get my name out there and so on. Came to a point where my brother, my older brother said to me, and he dabbled with photography himself in the past, although he's not in it at the moment at all. Um, but he said to me at, at a certain point, Simon, you've got to give yourself a minimum price. You've got to set a minimum price, a, a minimum uh, fee, and do not do the job if it's less than that. So, for instance, if somebody said that um, I need a single picture, maybe a product shot or something like that, or uh, maybe it was, uh, I don't know, whatever it might be, I just need one or half a dozen shots, you know, I might have considered doing it at the time for £50 when I first started. But my brother said to me, after a while, you've got to set yourself a price, a minimum and don't go below it. And when I f my first minimum price was £150. That was the first price I set. That went up to 200 and currently it's 300 um, And if somebody wants me to go on a job and it takes 10 minutes or an hour or two hours, it's £300. Um, and I give up to two hours of time for that £300 and then I charge by the hour. Or if it's a wedding, then it's a price for the job. But... Um, it's quite important. So the point that you make, Hector, is, is definitely got uh, um, validity. You know, if you set yourself in a certain market, then you, you get perceived as fitting that market. Yeah, has your dad still got that shell pipe, uh, Tim? Uh, this is the pipe, Sandra. This is the pipe that I made 
once you put a stem on it, you can see the imperfections of how I finished it. And you can that, for instance, that line there, um, this whole bottom area needed to be a little bit more symmetrical. And the whole end of the pipe needed to be more symmetrical, this sort of section here. Um, so he's done the best that he can, given my bad workmanship. Um, it's kind of a bit weighted heavily on the right side, and if you can see that. But it's absolutely, you know, finishes off the pipe very well. I'm really excited to see the other pipe. Um, he's uh, the um, Eskimo shaped pipe. He's um, he started work on it, but uh, it was getting late, so we've left that. So hopefully he'll finish that over the next day or two. And I um, I did a bit of research online, and I printed out some pictures. Um, and I gave him some pictures to give him ideas of how to carve the stem. So he's doing one like that, which I'm really excited about. So I'm, I'm really chuffed and uh, excited to see how he finishes it off. So hopefully I'll get that in a few days. When I came back today, I got um, I had taken delivery of um, a cross vice, which will go in, uh, which will work in tandem with the drill press. Um, but um, I think after I finish here now um, on this live feed, I'm going to go back onto Axminster's West website and possibly order a lathe and just take the jump. Um, the weather is a little bit of an issue because it's really cold and my garage is not heated. Um, so I do have a heater in there, electric heater, but it struggles to keep up with the cold temperatures. But we'll have to see. Um, the problem you see with buying a lathe is that there's so many added bits that you need to buy with it. You need to buy the chuck. The chuck itself, you're going to spend £150 just on the chuck. So you might spend 300 or 400 pounds on a lathe. I mean, you can buy lathes for 200 pounds. Um, you can buy sort of non-branded lathes, Chinese lathes for 200 pounds, and you can buy an Axminster one, which is pretty much looks exactly the same, uh, and may well even be the same product um, for about three or 400 pounds. So the only thing is that with Axminster, you know you have a reliability. It's a company which you can rely on. So I'm just not sure if I should do that or not, or just buy one off eBay. For 200 pounds and have no comeback whatsoever. I don't know. Um, I'm probably going to go with Axminster. It's, it seems a bit stupid if it's uh... <laughs> yeah. I can shoot my own promo. Absolutely. Well, I'm probably going to if I do get there and I do actually get to carving pipes on a reasonably serious basis. Um, it will probably have London carving in there because I think it would be nice to show that it's a London made pipe. Um, so I'm going to try and incorporate that name into the into the name of the of my pipes. So there we have it really. It was a wonderful day. Um, Mike was a perfect host. Well, if they ever do go on sale, then I'm sure the f first places that it's going to go on is my IG page and this channel, I'm sure. So you'll all know about it. Um, and uh, if I do end up getting a lathe, I think I'll be just be too excited to just not get on with it. You know, I'll just have to plumb for it and uh, get moving on carving some pipes. I've got the briar blocks now. I should have some more stems coming in. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, yes, exciting, exciting, exciting. I, I do also want to get a bandsaw. Um, I've been kind of talking about getting a bandsaw for a while now as well. And um, and Mike said the same. He said it does save you a lot of time. You, you can just take off all the meaty parts of the, of the briar that you're going to sand off. And um, a bandsaw is quite flexible and you can get a little bit of shaping going on. Um, thanks Ryan, appreciate that. I'm excited myself. So I think that's... Uh, the, the problem is that to really get set up, it, there's, there's, there's a big expenditure and I'm effectively setting up a workshop from scratch. And um, 
I think a lot of people, when they start, they start off very low in terms of... Ian Walker um, of Northern Briars, he does everything on one lathe. He has a lathe on his uh, barge, which is on a canal. He has very limited space. Um, and he has a lathe, which he does everything on. He does the... Um, that's what uh, Mike just told me before. He does his stems, he does his bowls. Um, I'm not sure if he does his uh, buffing with that as well, possibly. I'm not sure. But yeah, change out of color, absolutely. So to some extent, I'm really in a curious position because um, I've got the sanding, the belt sander, although I've set it up now fully um, with all the sort of accessories on it, the, the table and um, the dust collection and all of that. And it's actually quite a small... Um, it's actually quite a small sander. Um, hi, Ben. Um, and the circular sander on the side is virtually useless. Um, the only thing it will probably be useful for is I, if I ever want to get a straight edge on uh, to sand something with a straight edge, then I could do that using the table that it comes with. Um, but um, the belt sander, I think that will be useful. Um, and I've sort of um, doctored it a little bit. I've taken off some of the support structures and the safety kind of housing around it in order to make it a little bit more accessible and to give me more of an area um, for sanding and, it, and in a bit more of a flexibility in, in the actual sanding belt itself. Um, so that's, that's set up now and I can use that no problem. I've used the industrial hoover that I bought, the vacuum cleaner, and that doesn't fit precisely in, in the porthole, but it does take in the dust, which is fine. Um, my drill press is still packed in the box. Um, I, ha <laughs> I haven't uh, unpacked that yet, so that needs to be done. But um, to be honest, if I get the lathe, I think it's going to end up being fairly redundant. Not completely, but fairly redundant. I can see there will be uses for it. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, and I'm really pleased that I, I stuck to my guns and, and bought the cheaper one. Because they were pushing me to, buy, when they couldn't find the drill press that I wanted, they were pushing me to, to get the more expensive one. And I didn't, and I'm very happy that I didn't. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy to have it, even if I do get a lathe. Um, there's that. I've got the rotary tool, which is like a Dremel. Um, it takes all the Dremel uh, accessories. So there's that. I've got them, the the... the motor with, uh, which takes the mops, the polishing mops. And those are still areas which I still need to increase on. Um, the, the, the drill press, um, possibly, um, I don't know. I have to still think about that because I can see that there will be uses for it. Um, so I'm not sure. Because, yeah, 100% Sandro. Um, believe me, when I was using the lathe today um, at uh, Mike's place, I was very aware of that. And Mike, <laughs> no goggles, <laughs> no mask, no gloves, no nothing. He was just at it, you know. And his hands are not all gnarled up, so he's obviously very, very used to working like that. But um, <laughs> I posted a picture on... on uh, on Facebook, on various different groups that I'm a member of, and one of them was the uh, UK one. Um, and somebody said, in one of the in the picture that I, I put on, if you see on IG, um, there's a fire escape door in the background, and it's completely blocked with stuff. Um, and somebody said, "Is that a joke? <laughs> that fire escape sign, or is it real?" Um, yeah, so not the most safety conscious person, a very, probably a non PC kind of person, but uh, my kind of guy, really. Um, yeah, but as I say, the drill press, um, I will probably keep it because the amount I paid for it, I, I'd barely get a set of chisels with it. So um, it's, it's something that will get be useful, you know, and uh, it's something that I can use. Um, you know, it could be in the future that I'll, I'll sort of expand. Once I'm used to a bit of turning, then um, I could expand to um, 
uh, making other bits and pieces, tampers and things like that. And it would be good to have a drill press to be able to drill in um, certain things, or possibly to drill. Um, I've got. A th I want to think of a, a a little adornment to put on my pipes at some stage, assuming I get to some kind of commercial stage. Um, you know, the equivalent of of the white dot, um, but something which is unique to me. And there's lots of different um, sort of markings which people do, and they all, a lot of them are a derivation of a dot of some kind. Um, so I want to think of something which has a, a good look about it and doesn't look too contrived, but at the same time look at the same time looks classy. So a drill press would probably work very well with that. And yeah, pipe stands, you know, possibly pipe boxes, presentation boxes for pipes, um, and and that kind of thing. Uh, put the kit on the press, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I'm 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 holding on to the drill press. Um, my machine, my computer takes an awful long time to process videos. It's an uh, it's a Windows PC i5. Uh, it's been processing for probably about an hour now, and it's still only halfway through. If I would do it on my laptop, it blazes. It would have done it in five minutes, ten minutes. Anyway, by the by. So, um, it was really exciting, had a great time, great fun, um, and it was fantastic to, to get on the lathe, it really was. Um, I think that um, if I get a decent set of chisels, and that's a policy I've, I've done in all areas of my working life, when I started doing photography, I bought the best equipment that I could afford. Uh, I always bought the L lenses, uh, the Canon line, the professional line. I've never used anything other than an L lens when I'm working. Uh, actually, I tell a lie. I used um, an EFS lens when I used a, a cropped uh, chip camera once. Or, but I haven't, generally speaking, I only use the L lenses, and it's for the same reason. Um, you know, when you're working and in a professional line, you want to make sure that you've got equipment that you can rely on. Uh, having said that, making, uh, buying, investing in the various machines that I've bought so far, I've deliberately not spent a fortune. But when I'm buying the tools for the lathe, I think I will spend, um, a, 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 I'll get at least a medium, if not higher than medium range set of chisels. I think that's going to be important. Yeah. And I do need to get another motor on which to mount um, a French wheel of some kind, possibly, for sanding. Do need that as well. Good evening, Fouride. So, should I uh, give this the honey treatment and fire it up? What do you think? You never had the cojones. There's nothing. There's nothing to it, really. There's nothing technical about it, and it won't do any harm to your pipes because it just turns to carbon after your first smoke, pretty much. I cleaned this out with alcohol earlier on because there's always shavings and dust and all kinds of lovely things. I tell you what, when you, I mentioned this earlier on, when you're when you're cutting ebonite stems and Cumberland stems, it's um, it's pretty gross. The the smell is pretty gross. If you've um, Eric, if you're still there, um, you know you'll know that as soon as you sand an ebonite stem, you get that aroma. It's worse than granny pants, Ben, I can tell you that much. Okay, I think we're good to go. 
I don't have Presbyterian. The last time I tried that was uh, probably two years ago, and I only tried it once. And at the time, I didn't really like it. And Ben, you'll be pleased to know that uh, Mike Billington is a granny pants kind of guy. He's smoking today, and you'll see that in the video when you when it's finished uh, processing. Um, he smoked today the same thing he smoked two years ago, and it's what he smoked. Um, best broken flake, I think it's number seven, which is a which is a, a Lakeland mixed with Erin Moore, and I took my jar of aged Erin Moore along with me, and I gave him about a quarter of a jar's worth because. He likes Aaron more, so I was actually quite happy that I was able to give him something. Yes, thank you, Jimmy. Um, thankfully, it didn't really develop into a full-blown cold, but my wife is suffering and my son is suffering at the moment, but uh, hopefully they'll be fine in due course. Um, what do we suggest for the first smoke in here, people? Something non-granny pants and non-latakia. That's something that hopefully would drown out the new pipe flavours. RB plug, I haven't got any RB plug. And for a Virginia, hmm. yeah, that is the kind of the idea. Mix is really to get um, full Virginia flake is too. Yeah, that's a good call, um, uh, Ben. Full Virginia flake is a little bit too light for me for to, to have on a first smoke. All right, okay. I finished my. Um, Um, my Asquith mixture I finished, that would be ideal. I've got another kit to blend, but I haven't done it yet. so good so this is a dark twist I uh, know that's the wrong one dark twist with some added perique which um, blending perique which I added to it and then pressed it and hey presto Contrary to popular practice, um, I don't do half a fill when I first light up. I tend to do a full fill because I want the char to go from the top to the bottom, especially with the honey. I want it to burn that honey and create that layer of char, uh, of carbon on the inside of the bowl. At the same time, I don't want to scorch the briar, so we just push it in just below the rim and use a soft flame or a match. Right. 
Clay pipes and bees. Did I put a filter in? No. I can smell the stem from here. It's pretty off-putting, actually. You know that uh, smelly drain smell you get when you sand a bit of ebonite? And it's still on there. I did clean it before and try and get rid of it, but it uh, hasn't really helped. But we shall soldier on. He actually did a really nice tight fit, which is, I mentioned that in the video to him, which is very rare. Um, usually the filters, or often, I shouldn't say usually, but often the filters just rattle around inside. But this is a really good fit. Just don't want to push it in too much because then it does make the airflow a little bit restricted. goes. Nothing quite like tobacco coming up to greet you. I love that. Hi Jordan. Well that's kind of the idea. You're supposed to be getting the flavour of char, char grill. That's what English blends are all about. Latakia gives you a smoky flavour. That is the whole point. Um, but uh, you may want to start off with vapours, maybe Virginia Periques, and that will give you a, a nice, rich, sweet, strong, spicy flavour together with those Virginias. I don't mind telling you, it smokes like a dream. Jordan, what I would tell you is, never say never. That's what I did. When I first started smoking a pipe, I tried Latakia blends, English blends, and um, they repulsed me initially. But um, what I would suggest is that you carry on exploring different genres of tobacco and revisit them perhaps in six months' time. First master smoking a pipe with a tobacco that you enjoy, otherwise you might sort of just get put off generally. And I'm not here to push you into pipe smoking, but if you want to smoke a pipe, first find a tobacco that you like. Smoke it for a few months. Get used to packing a, a bowl. Get used to keeping your uh, um, pipe alight and... Um, how to smoke it, the speed that you smoke it, the temperature that you keep the tobacco at, tamping, all of the uh, processes, get that down pat and then carry on exploring. I'm the same Ryan, um, I don't enjoy cobs. I, I enjoy the odd bowl in a meerschaum but generally speaking briar is the medium for me. Nothing else works like Briar for me. It was either Briar Blade, it was either Ladon, or it was um, uh, Danny Shaw, but I think it was Ladon. Just realised Mike Strata's not on. He's wondering where all the smoke's coming from.
Um, Latakia, if you smoke it regularly in a pipe, yeah, it could. Um, you could get some ghosting. Maybe not as much as Granny Pants blends, uh, Lakeland blends, but um, Latakia will leave behind a flavour for sure. I don't know if it's got anything to do with the honey, but I can hear crackling coming from my bowl. You know what's interesting? When I pop the cherry, so to speak, on a pipe, And Ben is not going to agree with me on this. But when I smoke a pipe for the first time, or maybe the second time, I can usually tell if I'm going to enjoy this pipe or not. Having said that, Ben is right. Ben is far more experienced. And one case in point was that uh, Soren Refberg pipe. Oh, well, there it is. Which I tried and tried and tried to smoke Virginia's and Vapors in, and uh, I just couldn't get the right flavours out of it. And I put a Latakia blend in it, and bang on, absolutely spot on. So, just goes to show you that I'm wrong. Truth is, it's more like Granny's pocketbook, but uh, Granny Pants just sounds more fun. Yeah, 100%, Ben. Um, I'm just saying that I, I can often tell if I'm going to like a pipe or not, but it's, um, I'm, it's baloney because none of my pipes are broken into the extent that some of yours will be. And... Um, except maybe uh, some of the, the estate pipes. But um, with my pipes being the age that they are, um, I'm going on, on that basis. Um, bowl shapes. Uh, you can ask Ben, the Artful Kodja, but I personally, whilst you can see some differences, um, I don't hold much, uh, I don't give that a huge amount of importance um, in terms of bowl shapes. Yes, a wider bowl will give you more flavour, especially with a mixture blend, because you've got more of a, a surface being burnt, but you know, some people talk about long, thin bowls, uh, narrow bowls for Virginia Flakes, things like that. And that's maybe just a practicality for those people who fold and stuff. But I've really, you can ask Ben, he's obviously more experienced, but in my experience, I've not seen a great deal of, um, you can have differences from pipe to pipe, but not necessarily because of the shape. It could be because of the briar, um, that's for sure. You'll have, uh, you can have two identical pipes and one of them will smoke fantastically and one won't and one may have been cured properly and the other one not, or you just have a bad piece of briar. That's, that's very possible. But I, I've not really seen um, a huge difference in terms of smokeability. Um, there are some um, caveats to that. So in terms of you know, thinner walled pipes against thicker walled pipes, yeah, it does help to... I mean, that's just a practicality that that's gonna, won't get as hot as a thin walled pipe and um, a, a, a pipe which has got a significant rustication on it will also be cooler than a smooth pipe. And it will dissipate the heat better. But overall, I personally haven't seen a huge difference between pipe shapes that is consistent. Yes, there are differences from pipe to pipe, but not ones that cons give you a consistent um, sort of study where you could say this shape does that, this shape does that, and that shape does that, regardless of 
which pipe it is or which pipe maker it might be. I'm curious how people actually count how many bowls they've had. I wouldn't know, but no idea. Um, I suppose if you if you ha if you smoked a pipe even once a week, and you smoked for two years, then you've got a hundred smokes. But uh, I have no idea how many times I've smoked my pipes. Jordan, that's going to be uh, could be a couple of things. Um, it could be the speed that you're smoking. It could be the humidity of your tobacco. It could be the dryness of your tobacco. Um, it could be the fact that your pipe isn't broken in yet, if it's a smooth pipe, certainly. Um, if you haven't got any kind of uh, carbon layer built up, a cake built up, on the inside of the pipe that will cause it to get hot sugar content yep absolutely little notches on the stem that sounds like a, a what's his name a, a carries I do keep such a diary, Tim. It's called YouTube. Hi, Dale. Yeah, we had a great time today. Not a bad idea though, uh, Ben. If you do that, you can take a smooth pipe and turn it into a rusticated pipe. I wouldn't like to see the state of your bedposts, Ben. Frog Morton on the bayou. It's actually quite nice. I think that's it. Is that uh, one with Perique? Orientals? No? I have a little bit left of that. And believe it or not, that's still from the first set of samplers that I bought the first time I tried Latakia's and got repulsed by it. I bought a sampler set from, I think it was tobaccopipes.com, and that must be nearly three years ago now. And you got five, you got a 40 gram tin of each of the uh, Frog Mortons. And um, I hated them when I started off. And I think I've still got a smidgen of each one left. The cellar, I don't. I've I've gone through it and opened my own tins, but the rest of them, I think, are still from that original uh, tin, that forty gram tin. Um, I've got a I've got a few tins of Frog Mortons. Um, I think I've got a a hundred gram tin of of Town, and maybe another fifty gram tin of Town. I've got two or three cellar tins. I think fifty gram tins. Uh, I've got a few of the Frog Mortons, not, nothing huge, just uh, enough if I ever fancy it. I don't, I'm not really on them at all these days, but... Good evening, Rifat. Tell you what, it's not keeping a light, that's for sure. Ben... 
Would new pipe have anything to do with that? With the tobacco not staying alive? No, your tobacco is dry, it's not, it's not wet. Well, actually, there is moisture in it when I squeeze it. You want some cellar? Let's see if I've got any open. Hang on. found some English legacy. If you watched uh, the mayor's video, Derek Tant, he, um, he talked about English legacy, which Aaron um, Bryboy makes. And I bought um, quite a fair, I think it was eight ounces of him back in March 2016, nearly three years ago. And I've still got that bit left. It's pretty punchy stuff. Hi John, hi Matches, how are you doing? Um, yeah, so in terms of the Frog Mortons, in terms of started stuff, I've got a bit of Bayou, a bit of Town, and a bit of Cellar. My next package is cherry. I'll try to uh, bear you in mind with some of that cellar. The Blakemar video is still processing. It'll be available probably either later on tonight if it still takes as long as it's taking. Um, it'll, I'll have to leave it running when I go to bed and um, I'll upload it in the morning. But it will be a good watch if anybody enjoys watching pipe carvers and listening to what they have to say. Um, it's just under an hour's worth of Mike Billington at Blakemar. So I've just lit up um, this self-made pipe and this stem was fitted by Mike today and in it I'm smoking some dark twist with some added perique which I some blending perique which I added and then pressed. Tasty stuff. Good evening, Elwood. How are you doing? We've been talking about my visit to uh, Blake Marbriars today. Um, and it was a very, very enjoyable afternoon. And my highlight, as I mentioned earlier on, was that uh, Mike offered me a go on the lathe. Um, Oh, I haven't perfected the craft. I have not even touched the craft yet. Honestly, seriously. The perique adds a little bit of sweet, um, je ne sais quoi. It's not really even spicy. Um, it's, it's not peppery or spicy or anything like that. It's, it just adds a richness to it, even a chocolatey kind of sort of twang to it. It's a very interesting effect that the Perique has on this blend.
Um, we had a long chat about that earlier on, about the lathe. Um, and um, I probably will um, plumb for the lathe. It seems that there's just too much restriction. Although it's all doable, thanks pipes, etc. Have a good one, enjoy your dinner. Um, although it's all doable without a lathe, it's just so much simpler once you've mastered it. And um, I must say, I, I did find it um, quite challenging when I first put the chisel to the wood. He uses very small chisels and the feedback that comes through from the wood down the chisel and into your arm muscles is really quite significant. Um, and so I'm hoping that that will be easier with the full size chisels. And the way his lathes are set up, you know, they're being made to suit what he does and what he's been doing for the last 30, 40 years. And it's not traditional. We talk about it in the video, which you'll see when I upload it. But um, he um, he rests his chisel on another tool, which then rests on the tool rest. And he has it at an odd angle compared to what most people do with their lathes. Now, I haven't settled on a model yet. Um, my biggest deliberation at the moment is whether to get a, a non-branded um, version off eBay for about £200 or to spend another 100 or £200 pounds and get from a reliable company um, and given what I'm hoping to do and hoping to where I'm hoping to get I think it makes sense even though I haven't necessarily got that disposable income but it just makes sense to get something which is going to be more reliable and have the backup of a company should I have any problems you know if I need advice and that kind of thing it just seems to be logical to do that it's just worth that money even for that backup. Yeah, 100% Ryan, and as I said before, it's what I've done with my photography equipment. I've always bought the best that I can. Whilst with all the other tools that I've bought for, for this carving, I've kind of kept it at the low end of things. But I think when it comes to the lathe, once I get into the lathe, I think that's going to be, I'm going to be on that for the majority of the time. It's going to be about the lathe and about sanding. Those are the two chief things that I'll be doing. Um, so, in fact, the sanding is probably the most time consuming of making a pipe. And then comes the lathe, uh, from my limited experience, obviously. Then comes the lathe. Um, and at the end, obviously, you've got the buffing. Um, but um, certainly the sanding, I think, is the most time-consuming. But the lathe is, needs, I think, the most skill um, and practice. Practice, practice, practice. When you're working with any machine, um, I think, especially <laughs> something moving at speed, um, it needs a lot of practice and care and attention, obviously. Um, I was quite hesitant when I uh, went to the lathe today because I just, it was a completely new experience and uh, I didn't want to go at it gung-ho like a typical sort of new guy, sort of cocky, yeah, I've seen all of this before, I'm going to get in there and shape a, a new high-grade pipe. I just went at it very slowly and just did simple strokes for simple folks. But um, I will be spending a reasonable amount of money on a set of a good quality set of chisels. I think that's going to make a lot of difference. Um, but there's still the, um, the 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 chuck I've got to get and find because you can't just buy a pipe chuck off the shelf. You can use a, a four a four jaw chuck or a four claw chuck, um, but they're not ideal unless you get one with longer claws. Um, so that's something for the future is is to get a custom made chuck possibly from Vermont Freehand, possibly from just the machinist um, here in the UK. I have asked uh, people like Phil Rivara, who are good metal workers or metallurgists, if that's the right word. And then there's, um, what's his name? Uh, Matches, you'll know his name. Guy who does a lot of metal work. Recently did a, a beautiful sign for the outside of his garage. Oh, what's his name? Somebody will remember. 
anyway, he's he's done a lot of smokers and things like you know made out of drums. Um, uh, John, I thought you'd know who I'm talking about. One of the OGs. One of the guys who's been on YouTube for a long time. It's friendly with the maybe it's a different group. I don't know, different uh, clique of YouTubers. But it was certainly friendly with uh, the Dagners. They've spent time together. No, not Jay. There's an older guy. Anyway, he does a lot of metal work. Awesome metal work. Um, so I'm going to just maybe contact a few of these people and see if somebody's going to be prepared to make me one. Hi, Chad. Yes, Sparky, yes. Is it Sparky Pipes? Uh, he's the same kind of group, but I don't think it's actually him. It's the same group. I know he does that kind of stuff as well, but there's another guy. Hang on, let me just... Uh, no, Jay, it's not Jay Hacker. Jay Hacker is... Uh, he's a nice guy, Jake, actually. I used to speak to him whenever I bought a pipe off him. I haven't bought a pipe for quite some time. He's not a pipe maker, no. Hi Clint, how are you doing? I don't think he's a pipe maker anyway. Yes, uh, Boswells did put a new sign up. Um, I actually um, sent them a message that I hope they keep the old one and put it on display somewhere because it's quite a piece of piping history. So um, I think it was Julie possibly who, who hit me, uh, sent me a message back and said that they, they are going to display it somewhere. just doing a search on, on smokers, on people making smokers. There are so many people making smokers out of drums and tanks. So the chances of me finding him looks like it might be quite slim. I'm just going to search for Sparky Pipes. Maybe it is him. Yeah, I'm on his channel now, looking at it. No, that's Sparky. I, I thought that was him. It's not him, but I think he's in his videos, though. The guy that I mean. And I can see he matches is commenting on his videos. Daniel Shaw. Sorry, guys, this is a bit boring for you, but I'm kind of, it's kind of bugging me. Maybe it is him. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is him. Anyway, I'm 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 gonna stop with this because that's not fair. So yeah, um, it's been a fun day. Really enjoyed it. And um, as I said earlier on, it, it's the pricing is ridiculous.
you can buy an absolutely superb pipe from him for 40 quid. Yeah, the value for money is really second to none. I don't know anybody that uh, sells pipes for the prices that he uh, charges. Okie dokies, people, I think it's... Uh... Hi, PA Piper, how you doing? I think it's been long enough. We're, we've been on for an hour and a half, and it's 12 o'clock, and I need to be up at 6.15 tomorrow morning. So I'm going to wish you all a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining me. I had a fantastic time today at Blake Marbriars. It was really a, a special experience for me. Um, and uh, the timing was just right as well. Um, and, uh, you know, perfectly timed in the journey that I'm on at the moment. So hopefully it will help to keep the wheels a rolling. Um, the video, I think, is going to end up being up tomorrow morning, so look forward to that. It's a good video. I'm, I'm, forget, I'm not talking about the editing or anything like that, the content, just to be able to watch and listen to Mike. I wish I could have spent more time there, um, but uh, it's, it's just good seeing. I'll tell you something, the amount of stuff, the amount of stuff that he's got there, and a lot of it will be legacy from his uncle that he took over from in 1986, he says, um, but he's got boxes and boxes and boxes of stems, stem material. He must have thousands, literally, I'm not exaggerating, thousands and thousands of stems there, which are ready to be um, put onto pipes. And he's got boxes of pipes, you know, in all different stages of progression, from briar blocks through to stumbles, through to rough cut stumbles, through to fully shaped, waiting to be uh, rusticated, some waiting to be smooth pipes and just unbelievable it, it's it's like a an aladdin's cave in there uh, right at, towards the end i came across a box of um, acrylic um, little acrylic rods uh, which you would use for um, adornments pipe adornments like uh, this kind of thing rings so i talked about that briefly with him because uh, i wanted to understand how those are mounted onto pipes um, but it, the amount of stuff he's got there is just unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the colorings, the dyes, the recipes that he uses are probably from 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, but he was really, as I say, he was very humble, very willing to share information. Um, yeah, it, it was a great day. And I hope I'll, I'll get there a bit sooner. The last time I was there was two years ago. Um, so I hope I'll get there a bit more often. And the drive was okay as well. It took me about an hour and a quarter to get there, which is really not too bad. It still left me with about three hours of time with him, which was very, very good. So, once again, I wish you all a very good night. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully see you tomorrow morning at some point. Thanks very much. Catch you on the next.